Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, the fifth book of the New Testament. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that and make it your own as a gift from us to you. So this morning, we embark on an exciting new journey, all right, that will probably take us more than a year, who knows how long. We begin our walk through the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles holds a vital place in the New Testament, picking up where the gospel leads off after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what happened next? The book of Acts provides a really important historical link detailing the spread of the early church, how the gospel exploded in Jerusalem and then spread throughout the Roman Empire. The historical link for even where we are today. But in addition to being a historical account, the book of Acts is so much more. It holds such an important, a paramount theological place because it is the transition hinge of Jesus' earthly ministry to his heavenly reign of the transition of covenants from the Mosaic law to the law of Christ, uh, from, the, from the temple in Jerusalem to the church being filled with the Spirit of God, and we become the living temple, living out our entire lives as worship and on mission for Jesus. It's where we finally see the good news of the one true God. You finally see it go outside of the people of God. And the people of God finally reach out to the nations and bring unity and healing like never before. The church, the Holy Spirit, the gospel transforming and the gospel going. The story of Christ's church 2,000 years ago and yet the foundation for us right here in Bernie, Texas, called to the same purpose, invited on the same mission as our forefathers. Acts 1.8. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Church, are you ready? Are you ready to go on this adventure to open up God's word and to see what it has for us? This morning's going to be a little unique. It's going to be uh, an introduction for the first half. We're going to introduce and we're going to look at the context that Luke writes. We're going to look at uh, really the unique historical aspect and importance of the book of Acts for us. And then we're going to press into Luke's story as the author, what we can know and what we can piece together about who Luke was. And really, I want us to ask the question, what is his testimony towards us? Because he was changed by Jesus. He went on mission and he was is going to challenge us to live on mission. So you turn and hold your spot in Acts chapter one. I'm going to begin reading the first four verses of Luke chapter one. I want, I want to read that and then uh, the first two verses in Acts, and you'll see why, because Luke Acts is a, it's a tandem account that's put together. So listen as I read the first four verses of Luke chapter one. Inasmuch as have, as have undertaken to compile an account of the things uh, accomplished among us, Just as were handed down to us by those from the beginning, who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. That's the beginning of the book of Acts, the gospel of Acts. And now picking up 
sorry, the Gospel of Luke, and now picking up in the book of Acts, you can see that the author Luke continues in that same vein. Listen to the first two verses of the book of Acts. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all things that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning. God, always longing to hear from you. God, how exciting it is for us to gather together, for us to hear the baptismal testimony, for us to hear Pastor Mark give an account of your faithfulness in the difficulties and trials of life, how you have held him and his wife, how you have given strength and comfort as only you can. And now this morning, Father, as we come to your word, as we listen to an account testimony that Luke gives to us about himself and all that he detailed, God, it is always our deepest aim to know you. God, I pray all across this room that your spirit will lift heads and will call us, your people, forward into mission, into more faith, with, with a confident assurance that you who began this work in us will give us the strength, will give us the power to walk out and to be your witnesses in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that the two-volume Luke Acts comprises the largest portion of any one writer in the New Testament? Do you know that Luke penned more uh, words of the New Testament than any other writer? And that includes Paul. In ancient times, it was common for a wealthy patron to commission histories, usually family histories, to establish a a credible family line or to uh, glorify one's family achievements. All right, but it was common for a wealthy patron to commission histories. And as we see from the opening of both Luke and Acts, that Luke the physician had been commissioned by a patron, Theophilus, to record not a family history. Well, a family history in a sense, it's the, the history of Jesus and the early church. He probably met Theophilus while he was traveling around with Paul on his missionary journeys. Now, it is not clear if Theophilus is an actual name or just a title, because the name means one who loves God. But what is clear is Luke's intentions. Okay, That is that he has investigated everything carefully. He has spoken to eyewitnesses to those who knew Jesus all the way back to the beginning. He probably came across many family members and interviewed them. And he has written down an orderly account so that you too may know the truth about Jesus. You see, it's an invitation to come and listen. Come and see what God has done and what God is doing, that God has entered into human history. He's moving. He's revealing himself. And these events, they they proclaim a truth that must be examined. It is so worthy of your attention. These truths must be examined because if they are true, they deserve the allegiance of your entire life. Now, what becomes apparent when you think through like what we have here in the Bible, what becomes apparent? It's a small detail. It's so often overlooked and ignored, but it is this fact that Christianity is a faith based on historical facts, actual events that happened in reality. Right? It is not a set of philosophical ideas and platitudes like, say, Buddhism. 
All right, Buddhism makes truth claims regardless of Gahatma Buddha. Okay, remove him and you still have Buddhism. In fact, if you continue down this line of thinking, to borrow from D.A. Carson, every other major world religion exists apart from its founder, even Islam. If you were to say to a Muslim, what if Muhammad hadn't been the prophet? And he would say, well, we believe that he was the prophet, the prophet sent by God. Yes, yes, I know, but, but what if Muhammad hadn't been the prophet? Is, is there still Islam? Well, yes. Muhammad was just who God used to reveal himself. And so it is the same with Buddhism and on down the line, except for one, Jesus Christ. There is no Christianity without Jesus Christ because Christianity is knowing him, knowing a person that God entered into human history and took on flesh that he lived a perfect life. Listen, if that is not true, there is no Christianity. If there is not a virgin birth, there is no Christianity. And that he died on a Roman cross outside of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. And that he died according to the plan of God in order to pay for our sins as a substitute. And he was dead. An entire community witnessed his death. And early Sunday morning, on the third day, he rose from the dead as proof that he is the Son of God and that our sins are paid for. And he appeared to his brothers. Did you know that his brothers did not believe in him? all through his earthly ministry. It's, it's, a, it's a scandalous detail that, that's written through the Gospels. His own brothers didn't believe in him, but then suddenly James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. A complete transformation. He appeared to his disciples who go from fearful and hiding and running for their lives to willing to die for Jesus, take beatings, stand in the temple courtyard and proclaim the name of Jesus week in, week out. And he appeared to Paul, one who hated the church, persecuted the church, and then suddenly has a complete 180 and and walks in a completely different direction, spends the rest of his life on mission for Jesus, planting churches, even dies for Jesus. And he appeared to more than 500. It is a historical fact that Christianity exploded right there in Jerusalem, immediately following Jesus' death and resurrection. This is very important apologetically. Listen, let me contrast that with you with Muhammad. Muhammad was visited by an angel in a cave, by himself got special revelation that he initially thought was a demon. But his wife convinced him that it was an angel from the Lord and that he was a prophet. He goes back to Mecca where no one believes him. In fact, they persecute him. He leaves there, goes to another city where no one knew who he was, and he began to get converts. And then he goes back to Mecca with the sword. But Christianity... You're not taking one guy's word from a special revelation that an angel came to me, just believe me. In fact, we don't even have Jesus' own writings. And at first, you think that's a bad thing, but it's not. 
because we have an entire community witness, eyewitness accounts, documents written while everyone was still alive, radical conversions right here in time and history. And it's right here in your hands for you and I to read the handwritten account here from Luke, who was a medical doctor, had a scientific mind, and wrote with historical precision details about dates and leaders and cultural events. And he is inviting you, come and listen. Come and see what God has done. Come and be a part of what God is doing. But Luke's writings aren't just a historical testimony for you and I to consider. They are also a personal testimony, right? The historical matters because you have a guy who has investigated, has written out an orderly account, but at the end of it, he says, I've been changed by it. I believe this and I want you to know the truth Also, you see, he's a life that's been changed, that God found him, that Jesus saved him, that he accompanied Paul on missionary journeys, that he witnessed miracles. And underneath it all, he's calling us to believe in the same Jesus that changed him. So I'd like to take the rest of our time today, and I want us to look and think about our author, Luke. Who was he? What can we know about him? Right? The guy who who penned more words in the New Testament than any other author? Well, interestingly, we actually know very little about him personally, because he kept the spotlight off of himself, and he wrote about Jesus or how the Holy Spirit was working through the apostles. But here's what we do know. Colossians 4, 14 tells us that Luke was a Gentile and a medical doctor who had joined Paul on missionary journeys. In the book of Acts, there are three extended passages during the, the, the journaling of Paul's missionary journeys, where the language switches from they, referring to Paul and his team, the language switches to we, presumably because Luke has joined the travels for this portion of the journey. So on Paul's second missionary journey, as Paul had been going through Galatia, That region, Galatians 4.13 tells us that Paul had a severe bodily ailment. A severe bodily ailment. Now, there's a wide range of speculation here. But one of the most probable is that he had contracted a severe form of malaria. And he was having epileptic seizures as a result of that. And the lingering results... (coughs) is what we might call the thorn in the flesh uh, that's referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If he contacted malaria and had ongoing seizures, maybe that's the thorn in the flesh of 2 Corinthians 12. Now, it was just after Paul had gone through this region of Galatia that Luke joins in the journeys, okay? Uh, in Troas and over to Philippi. You can see I've made a little chart for you there. Did Paul's companions find Luke as a doctor for Paul? Was Luke already a believer or did Paul lead him to faith in Christ? We don't know. Luke traveled with Paul and Silas to Philippi and in Philippi is where they are beaten thrown into prison, okay? Certainly Luke tended uh, and cared for their wounds. But after a miraculous earthquake that released Paul and Silas from prison, 
Luke did not accompany Paul and Silas to Thessalonica. He stayed there in Philippi. That's where the we section stopped. Was the persecution too much? Is that why Luke dropped out? Was that his hometown? Did he have family there? We don't know. Now, it's not until Paul's third missionary journey, after he had actually gone through Philippi once, he came back through Philippi on his way to Jerusalem. That is where Luke picks back up with Paul. And at this point, he probably stays with Paul the rest of his life. Luke, leaving everything, journeyed back to Jerusalem where Paul would be captured. You can follow the, the we account through. He journeyed with him from Caesarea to Rome. This includes the shipwreck that Paul endures. And Luke is going to stay with Paul in Rome while he awaited trial underneath house arrest. All the way until the end of the book of Acts, Luke is right there with Paul. And in fact, church history tells us uh, that Paul was released after the trial at the end of the book of Acts, and that he probably went, or, or that he went on a fourth missionary journey, probably all the way to Spain. Okay, but three or four years later, he would be captured again by the Roman authorities, and this is where Nero, who hated Christians, was dead set on putting Paul to death, and Paul would die in this account. Second Timothy is the final account that we have in Paul's life. It's after this fourth missionary journey. It's after he's been captured for a second time, and he knows he's about to die. In Second Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is not with him, and telling him, come quickly, because I know the end is near. In that letter, Paul tells us, all have deserted him that he is alone except for Luke. Luke is the only one that is there all the way until the end. You see, a physician turned historian, Bible author, turned missionary, turned suffering friend to the apostle Paul all the way until the end. I've been meditating on these facts all week and feel pressed for us to ask some really important questions about our gospel writer, who was Luke as a man. The reason is, guys, it's so easy for us to imagine the, the giant of a, of a man of faith, like his final form at the very end. It's so easy for us to, to just think of him in those terms. But the reality is, is we all grow in faith, right? God uses circumstances in our life to stretch us and to grow our faith. So where do you think Luke was when Paul first entered his life? I mean, he's a medical doctor, we know he's organized, he's orderly in all that he does. How do you think he was stretched by the uncharted missionary journeys? Right, by Paul waking up going, I got a dream, we're going this way. How do you think that stretched Luke? By the risk, by overcoming fear, by being persecuted and shipwrecked. The cost of leaving all that's comfortable, his medical practice, his family, to go on this amazing God-sized adventure filled with joy, but one that had obstacle after obstacle that seemed insurmountable, and yet he would see the gospel always going forward. And that the spirit, no matter the obstacle, the spirit would continue to fan the flame of the church reaching out into new areas, shining a light into the darkness, touching and reaching uh, cities and areas that, that seemed to be demonic strongholds, but, but the gospel would go in and a church would be planted and the church would overcome. 
like in, like in Ephesus, where, where they had revival and they, they turned from their idols and they burned like thousands and thousands of dollars worth of books to turn to Jesus. How do you think all of that changed Luke? So here in a moment, I'm going to perform a little character skit where, where I'm Luke, okay? But before we do that, I, I want to show you something important and why I'm, I'm going to do it this way. I want to show you how Luke writes. So Acts 1.8 is the thesis for the entire book of Acts, okay? Acts 1.8, the thesis. And we're going to look at it next week in its context and detail. But for this week, I also want you to understand that it is, it is Luke's personal testimony, okay? That you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That Luke is saying to us, I received power when the Holy Spirit came upon me and he made me his witness, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. In that, in chapter one, verse eight, I told you it's the thesis. I want you to look at verse six right before that because Luke writes something very interesting and I think it's an important point for us this morning. Luke records in 1.6 that the disciples are asking Jesus Hey, when's this supposed, when's this going to look like what we expected it was going to look like? When are you going to overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel? That's what we're expecting the whole time. This whole death, and that was death and resurrection. That was pretty cool. But like, when is it going to look like what we think it's going to look like? And basically the answer is, it's not. You don't get to write God's program. God is not offering your plans. Rather, God is offering his plans. Okay? And the Spirit's going to come upon you and you will receive power, but you're going to be my witnesses. And it's going to be nothing like what you look like or expected. The gospel's going to go forward. It's going to be incredible, but it's not your plans. I really like to think in th that Luke put that there, the stark contrast of like, hey, this is what we're expecting. Is that going to happen? And then Jesus is like, listen, this is what's going to happen. The Spirit's going to come and he's just going to take you on a journey. It's going to be so different. I'd like to think that that comes out of Luke's life. All right, pastor, why are you wearing a Pepsi hat? Okay, two reasons. First of all, I mean, you guys know I'm not a Pepsi drinker. Obviously, I'm a Coke drinker because Coke is number one. Uh, but someone, people are always asking me to do crazy things up here. And someone told me they'd give me 20 bucks if I put this on on stage. So I just earned 20 bucks, all right? And the second reason is this is, so, so I wore my fedora. This is my, my Luke doctor hat, okay? So I'm, I'm entering into character. And, and as I do, listen, I, I'm trying to put skin or fill in the, the picture of, of Luke's journey and what he went through and, and just to know that like he grew in faith and we grow in faith and so some of this uh, I'm making, I've told you the factual details, but I, I'm, I'm trying to fill it in because I, I want to press with a, with a really important point at the end, and, and it's what it says to you and I. When I first met Paul, I didn't think he would make it. I mean, he had a real severe case of malaria. He was on his deathbed, and, and his buddies came and, and found me and begged for me to care for him. I had to nurse him for months, and I would check on him day after day, and, and every time I sat and talked to him, he just kept wanting to talk about 
this Jesus, this Jesus. He wanted to tell me about his Jesus. He, he acted like he knew God personally. I mean, I had grown up knowing God, but, but not like Paul described. He would tell me that he actually was a persecutor of the church, that he hated Jesus, that he was doing everything in his power to stop the church. And then one day on, on his road while he was going to persecute, he saw the risen Christ. Can you believe that? I mean, I didn't, but the more he talked about it, like there was this, this longing inside of me. I, I noticed myself like, like looking forward to our conversations and asking him questions and, and, and just wanting to hear more about this Jesus. And then one day I, I couldn't stand it anymore. There was this pounding in my chest and I, I just had to. It was one night I, I looked at him and I said, Paul, can I be saved? Can I know Jesus the way you do? What must I do? And he said, repent of my sins and believe that Jesus died for them and was resurrected. I can't describe the hope and peace that flooded my soul for the, for the first time. I was more alive. And it was greater than, than what I had ever imagined to finally have peace and to know God personally. It was, it was all I could do. I, I, was, I was just soaking up anything that I could from them. And so, so I told them, I asked, hey, can I, can I come with you on the journey? Can I keep going with you? And, and I did. They let me. I, I went with them to Troas and, and then to Philippi. And, and it, it was completely unlike me. I mean, I, I mean, I'm an organized, orderly. I plan out all of my days. And, and being on, on this, this journey, uh, I, I mean, it, it stretched me, but, but I was I was learning, and, and plus they needed me to help care for Paul and some of, his, uh, some of the lingering effects from his ailments. I knew I had a, a practice and a family to get back to, but, but I just needed to be there. And Troas and, and Philippi. When we got to Philippi, I, I had no idea what we were getting into. I mean, we, 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 we were just walking around telling people about Jesus, and then, and then suddenly it seemed like in an instant, the, the entire city, a large mob rose up and began attacking us. They, they were beating us. They were throwing things at us, and, and, and the authorities stepped in, and, and we thought, well, good, that finally the authorities step in, but wouldn't you know it, the, the authorities, they took Paul and Silas, and, and they beat them. And then they threw him in prison. I was overwhelmed with fear. I don't, have you ever experienced a mob coming at you? I mean, I, mean, I, I, I was filled with fear and, and restless, not only for me and for my life, but for Paul. Could his body sustain it? That night, I awoke to an earthquake. And wouldn't you know it, Paul and Silas were released from prison miraculously that night. And, and in a short time later, they were off to the next city of Theophilus. But I just got to tell you, I had to hit the pause button. It was it was overwhelming. There were so many things that were changing all at once. I didn't know what I was getting into. And, and they were just off to the, are, are they going to continue to be persecuted? Can they keep going like this? Plus, I, I had to get back to a family and to a practice. And so that's what I did. I departed, went back home. It took several months for the dust to settle. 
to what I thought I was getting back to ordinary life, but I knew that I had changed, that Jesus had changed me, like at my core. My wife gave testimony to it more than any other. She said, something's happened to you. And wouldn't you know it, Paul had planted a church in my hometown. And I would spend the next seven years, what I thought was just living a normal life, just, just going about my business. And little did I know that God was actually preparing me. First of all, I would give account and testimony to you that I walked through the, the most difficult trial of my life, and that was my wife's death. And through those two years of caring for her, Jesus sustained me. He gave me strength and peace and comfort. And short, shortly after she died, I knew I had to go back to Philippi where, where I really needed to face the scene and kind of the demons of my past, where I'd shrunk back in fear, where I was so confused about all that had happened and it had happened so fast, I knew I needed to go back there. And so I went back there and I, and I found Lydia because she's the one that allowed us to stay with her the first time. And I saw her and wouldn't you know it, when I was there, Paul came traveling back through. He said he was on his way to Jerusalem. And I asked him, Paul, do you think I could go with you? He replied to me, Luke, the Holy Spirit has told me bonds and affliction await me. I do not know what's going to happen in Jerusalem, but I do know this. Bonds and affliction await me. And I knew at that moment, if I said yes to going with him, I was saying yes to the very same fate. But I did. I went with him. And Theophilus, this is how I met you. On the greatest, most agonizing journey of my entire life, that I have been beaten, shipwrecked, hungry, had assassination attempts on my life. But all the while, God provided miraculously. I have seen and heard testimonies, accounts of all that Jesus did. And my friendship with Paul has been the only thing that could have allowed me to get over the death of my wife. And all the while my faith grew, that knowing these truths about Jesus has allowed me to know him personally. Just what I saw in Paul when I first met him. And the whole world may kick and scream and fight it, but this I know. Jesus Christ died for sinners and he saved me. The hardest thing that I ever walked through was saying goodbye to my friend Paul. But if you could have seen his face as he walked to the gallows, it was also the easiest thing. Theophilus, if there is one thing that I would say to you personally, it is get ready to be a living sacrifice used by God and for his purposes. You may never travel far, or be shipwrecked, but God wants to use you, stretch you, and it may not look like what you think. In fact, it won't look like what you think. But having your story added on to Jesus's story is the greatest honor that you could ever spend your entire life on. 
When Paul walked into my life, I had no idea that I would one day be writing to you. Church, Jesus is not a God who rubber stamps your plans. Rather, he's offering us the power to be his witnesses wherever that may take us. As your pastor, I have never once regretted saying yes to the Lord. Even when he was asking me for things that I thought I could never let go of. Always, he has taken what I've surrendered and given abundant life in return. I can only imagine in a room this size how many of us need to kneel right now at the foot of the cross and surrender. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, all across this room, if there is anyone here that does not know you personally as their Lord and Savior, God, I pray right now would be a moment of surrender that they would call out in faith, that they would repent of their sins and that they would believe. God, would you stir that up, please? If you are here this morning and you are a believer, I can only imagine there are plans in your life that need to be continually surrendered and that we would say to the Lord, you can use me however you see fit. Use me, Jesus. I also know that repeatedly there are sins that pop up in our life that prevent us from walking closely and knowing the Lord as we should. Would you right now kneel at the foot of the cross and would you repent of your sins? Would you lay them down? Would you say to King Jesus, I want to know you more. You are better than any other thing. King Jesus, have your way in us. Do business with us this morning. We love your word and we love your testimonies. They bring us life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.